You don't have to live the Christian life very long before you realize it's hard. No one promised it would be easy, and no one said that we could do it in our own strength. Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and as we study the book of Jeremiah with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, we hear one theme repeat itself, turn back to God. It was Jeremiah's message to the people of Judah, and it's God's message to every wandering heart today, in every generation. You've gone far enough. Now turn back. You know that we love to read letters. We do that so often on the program, and I try to include a few every week that I think are going to encourage you. So often we hear of people who thought that they were too far from God or that they had lived too hard of a life, or maybe they made too many bad decisions. But you know, like the prophet Jeremiah, who compassionately and passionately called people back to God, we keep telling the story of God's love and his forgiveness, and people, well, they're responding all over the world. In fact, listen to this note from a man who listens to Through the Bible in Cantonese. I have heard your teachings from the Bible. I am filled with hope and with questions. God has never been in my thoughts or a part of my life, but now I wonder what I have been missing. Please pray for me. Now, that's the kind of request that we can run with. In fact, if you'd like to pray for this man and millions of others listening to Through the Bible, then why don't you join our world prayer team as we pray every day for a different country. Signing up, it's super easy. Just visit ttb.org forward slash pray. Or if you'd like more information, you can call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. Now, let's not miss the opportunity that we have to pray together now. Heavenly Father, your love reaches to the heavens and across the entire earth. And we intercede for people in places where your word is not easily heard and almost never taught. So draw these who are yours to yourself, Lord, and thank you that your mercy reaches us no matter where we are. Open our hearts to the truth of your word today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now turn to Jeremiah 22 as we make our way through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, last time we left off here in Jeremiah, the harshest message given in the Word of God he gave here in this 22nd chapter we looked at last time. But because I was anxious to see the judgment against Coniah at the end of the chapter, I passed over his judgment against the father of Jehoiachin, the judgment against Jehoiakim. He was an evil ruler also, but during his reign, there was prosperity, and men were getting rich, and the poor were being ground underfoot. That was the picture that you have. And the very interesting thing is that God has a great deal to say in his word about the poor, the very fact that the word of God pays so much attention to that. You can't ignore it both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, will you notice verse 13? This begins God's message concerning Jehoiakim. Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness. That is, getting rich by a wrong method. And his chambers by wrong. That useth his neighbor's service without wages, and giveth him not for his work, you see, underpaid. And while the rich man's getting richer, the poor man is getting poorer. That saith, I will build me a wide house and large chambers and cutteth him out windows and it is sealed with cedar and painted with vermilion. Shalt thou reign because thou closeth thyself in cedar? Did not thy father eat and drink and do judgment and justice? And then it was well with him. Now he's referring back to Josiah, the good king. Now listen to what he says about him. He judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well with him. Was not this to know me, saith the Lord? But thine eyes and thine heart are not but for thy covetousness, and for to shed innocent blood, and for oppression, and for violence to do it. Now that chapter 22, and I read from verse 13 down through verse 17, and I could read on, but I'm going to break off the reading at that particular juncture, because here you find God's judgment that's pronounced upon them 
Two things were happening. The rich were getting rich by wrong methods, and the poor were getting poorer. And the average man actually was suffering in that day, while a few were getting rich. Now, God has a great deal to say about this. This man, Jeremiah, he calls attention to it here, that rich men were heaping up wealth by others' labors, and they were treading down the poor. And in their pride and in their arrogance, they built themselves palaces and lived as though God had forgotten their iniquitous means of the acquisition of wealth. And may I say to you that the Word of God has a great deal to say about it. He said in the New Testament, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl, for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you. There are two things that God condemns the rich for. The way they get money and the way that they spend money, the way they use it. And may I say this very candidly, that everything is slanted for the rich man. I find out that I'm paying more taxes than some men that are worth a million dollars. Well, you'd think I was a millionaire. And I've discovered that the tax laws are geared to protect the rich. And the politicians gear everything in favor of the rich, those that give to political campaigns. That's about all they do give to. They never give to the Lord's work. They never give anything to get the word of God out. And God notices that. And God recognizes that. The way they make it, they make it at the expense of the poor, and they spend it on themselves, building palaces to live in. Now, I want to say this very candidly, and I know that I step on some toes, and somebody's going to say, well, McGee, it's quite obvious you're sure not trying to get the support of the rich people for your program. Well, I'm giving you what Jeremiah gave. He never got the support of the rich either, and I'll have to take it on the chin. But very frankly, it's sinful for any man to live in a mansion while there's so many poor people today, they're in poverty. No Christian ought to do that. Now, if you've got that kind of money, why aren't you spending it to help some of the poor? And there are a lot of poor Christians. There are a lot of God's children today are poor folk, and they're not being helped. I know they're not being helped. And irrespective of color, there are a lot of poor people that are Christians, that God's children, and The rich Christian is passing them by while they're building mansions to live in. And I'm not sure that Christian organizations ought to have plush and luxurious accommodations. I want to be very frank today that until we deal with this, and religion caters to the rich. I meet many preachers that like to tell me, well, I have so-and-so, you know, he's a millionaire. He's a member of my church. Well, I'd like to know what he's doing to get the word of God out. I played golf with a man they told me was worth $20 million. They wanted me to play with him. He says, you know, he's interested in your program. He listens to it, you know. And we rode along, and I must confess, I told a man all about the program, not until he asked. And when he asked, I could give him an enthusiastic sales talk about the Through the Bible program, what it's doing today. And he, oh, he was interested, said he listened to the program. You know how much he's given to the program? Not one dime. You say, well, McGee, you're crying, <laughs> and you're using yourself as an illustration again. Maybe so, but I'm telling you what I know, and this is something I know today. And this is the thing that the Word of God condemns, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Read the epistle of James. He has a whole chapter devoted to the rich and the way that they get their money, and the way that they spend their money today. I'd hate to be a man, a Christian, that leaves a million dollars when I die. I think, my friend, you're going to be in trouble when you come in the presence of the Lord. He'll want to know, and I don't think he'd object to your comforts. I think he wants you to be. 
He wouldn't have given you all of that. But he also is going to hold you responsible for using it in a way for the glory of God. Now, I'm in trouble. I recognize that, but somebody needs to speak out on this because there's too much of this in the Word of God, and God makes it very clear here. In verse 16, he judged the cause of the poor and needy, then it was well with him. Was not this to know me, saith the Lord? God says, Josiah knew me, and he knew that he couldn't be my follower and not have a concern for the poor and needy because God says, I have a concern for them. The two groups of people that the hardest people to reach with the gospel, you know who they are? The filthy rich and the dirty poor, the one that are very poor and the one that are very rich. Now, God says, I'd like to equalize that because I want them to hear the gospel and be saved. I want the rich way up at the top to help those way down at the bottom. That's exactly what God is saying. And then those two groups can be reached with the Word of God. And that, may I say, I think is fundamentally the problem in America today. I do not think it's racial. I do not think it's a class struggle. I think it's a question today of rich and poor, my friend. That is the struggle that's in the world today. And communism never would have risen in the world if it had not been for the filthy rich and for the dirty poor. Those two. And it's the thing that God says he judges. My, it's difficult to let this alone. Now in chapter 23, we do have a ray of hope. What is the popular song, Every Cloud Has a Silver Lining? Well, this cloud, dark cloud, has a silver lining because it never got so dark but what the prophet didn't see down into the future. Now, in chapter 23, after this harshest judgment that's in the Bible against Coniah, then the sun breaks through. Now, he opens chapter 23, though, with this. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. And the pastors here are not preachers. He'll speak about the religious rulers later on. But here, the pastors are the kings, the politicians, the people that are ruling, the ones that are making the laws, those that are at the top. And God says, woe to them. Now, he says, therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, ye have scattered my flock, you've driven them away, and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. And God says he's going to judge them. And he did in that day. Now the sun breaks through. It never got so dark, but what the prophet didn't look down to the end of the tunnel, and he saw the light. Verse 3 of chapter 23 of Jeremiah, and I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I've driven them, and I will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase, and I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. God says, the day is coming that I intend to take over. And when I do, then you'll see the poor taken care of. And you're going to see an altogether different type of government than we have in the world today. Verse 5, Now behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I'll raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. Now, there's a king coming in David's line. But this king, Jeconiah, and all of this line, although they be in David's line, they are rejected and cut off. But you can't destroy God's purpose. You may think you can, but God will bring through another line, the line of Nathan, another son of David. And through that line, there will come a peasant by the name of Mary, a peasant girl up in Nazareth. And she's going to bear the Messiah. She's going to bear the king, if you please. And when he presented himself to the world, 
He says, behold, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and you can't have a kingdom without the king. What he said, the king is here, and they rejected the king. But my friend, he has the last word. He rejected them, and he said, the king's coming back someday, and he's going to set up that kingdom. And verse 6, in his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. May I say to you, have you ever heard of that being a plank in some political campaign that the man's righteous and he's going to act righteous? I haven't found that yet. They make every other claim except they're going to be righteous and they're going to follow God's plan and God's program for a government. They don't dare say that today. Verse 7, Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord. They shall no more say, The Lord liveth, which brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth, which brought up, which led the seed of the house of Israel out of the north country and from all countries, whither I had driven them, and they shall dwell in their own land. Now, this is one of the most remarkable prophecies in the Word of God. The oldest religious holiday that there is today is Passover, the Jewish Passover. And regardless of what type of uh, Israelite the man might be, could be Reformed or Orthodox, wouldn't make any difference. They remember the Passover, the deliverance out of Egypt. That goes back. God says the day is coming. When I bring them back into that land, which I shall do, that they'll forget the deliverance out of Egypt and they will remember this new thing that I intend to do. It'll so far surpass the deliverance out of the land of Egypt. This is tremendous, my friend. And you either believe this or you don't believe it. God's not through with the nation Israel. Now, verse 17, they say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, ye shall have peace. And they say, every one that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. And these dreamers today are talking about they're going to bring in world peace. And all of them are talking along that line. God says you won't do it. You can't do it. God says, as we saw in Isaiah, there is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Our problem is not the fact that you can't make peace and that people don't want peace. The trouble is that the heart of man is desperately wicked. Who can know it? We don't know how bad we really are. And wicked men in power today cannot bring peace on this earth. And if they can, they'll contradict God's word. Verse 21, he turns now to the religious rulers. He said, you can't trust today. The political rulers, they can't bring in this peace. They ignore the poor. And in verse 21, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. And God says, now this bunch of prophets, and the land was filled with them in that day. God says, I didn't send them. They're not giving my message at all. God rejected both the political rulers and the religious rulers. And I think that he do the same thing today in this world, all over the world. Because who's seeking for God today, even among the religious rulers of the world? They're out for religion. Oh, they're religion up to their eyebrows and as pious as a poison puppy. But they just don't happen to be seeking after the living and true God. Now, God says here in verse 30, Therefore, behold, I'm against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. And today, the liberal is casting reflection on the Word of God, says it's not the Word of God, stealing out of the hearts of people. I'd hate to be a godless college professor or a godless preacher today who is wrecking the faith of believers God says here, I'm going to do something about it someday. And God's in no hurry. Don't let that deceive you because judgment against an evil work is not executed speedily. It's in the heart of the sons of man to do evil. They think they're getting by with it. God says, I got eternity ahead of me. 
and I happen to be running the show anyway, and the time will come when I'll handle it. Now, we have here in chapter 24 the sign of the figs here. Good figs, bad figs. God makes the distinction between good and evil, and he does it here. And he says that it just happens to be I intend to send these people into captivity because these are bad figs. That is God's judgment and his estimation. Now you come in chapter 25 to a remarkable chapter because now Jeremiah, he spells out the captivity and even gives the length of time that they'll go into captivity. In chapter 25, verse 9, Behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, saith the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. Remember now, Daniel had led this man into a saving knowledge of God and will bring him against this land and against the inhabitants thereof and against all these nations round about and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment and a hissing and a perpetual desolation. Now, a great many people wonder why the land of Israel is not the land flowing with milk and honey today. A great water shortage is over there today. They desperately need water. Now, why is that true? God says, I intend to make it a perpetual desolation. I intend to let the world know I've judged not only a people, but a land. And the judgment of God is upon that land specifically as the curse of sin is in the entire earth. This earth is not producing near what it's capable of producing because the curse of sin is upon it. Now God says, moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the candle. God is taking away from them, he says, all the fun they've been having and no more marrying and giving in marriage. The sound of the millstone, business, commerce was going to end and the light of the candle, that's at home in the evening. There'll be no more of that. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. When God's dealing with the nation Israel, he deals with a calendar. He'll spell out the time. When he's dealing with the church, there's no time given. And you and I have no right today to say that even the Lord Jesus is coming soon. How do you know that? You don't know it. We have not been given a cow. Now somebody says, but McGee, you say you believe he's coming soon. That's right, and I say it right now. I believe he's coming soon. You want to know something? I don't know. We just don't know, and we have no right to say he's coming soon. We can just say we believe it. That's as far as we can go. Verse 12, it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolations. Now, God has done that. There's no argument here. If you want to argue this, you're arguing semantics and you're not arguing prophecy. God has accomplished this. Well, we're going to have to leave off right there today. And until next time, may God richly bless you. Because at that time, we'll pick up at verse 15 in chapter 25. You know, there's no argument for what God has accomplished or will accomplish in world history and in our own lives. In fact, there's a promise in Philippians 1 6 that says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Let that encourage you as you persevere in your faith. Now, in the next study, we continue our journey through Jeremiah, and looking ahead, it's not too early to download Dr. McGee's notes and outlines for our upcoming study in First and Second Timothy. If you listen by app, you'll find them in the menu, or get your free copy by downloading our digital book titled Briefing the Bible at ttb.org. If you'd prefer to have an abridged paperback copy sent to you by mail, call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE. And when you call us, ask to receive our terrific monthly newsletter that contains more great teaching by Dr. McGee and information on how you can pray along with our world prayer team. 
You know, I found this month's feature on Why Study Jeremiah really helpful, and I think you will too. Again, the number is 1-800-65-BIBLE, or download your copy immediately over at ttb.org. I'm Steve Schwetz, and until next time, God bless you as you walk with Him in His Word. Jesus made it all, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson Today's study with Dr. J. Vernon McGee is brought to you by Through the Bible, and it's made possible by the generous prayer and financial investments from listeners like you on the Bible bus all around the world.